today is John 14, 15 through 17, and Luke 12, 10 through 20. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, for he lives with you and will be in you. <clears throat> and Luke 12, 10 12. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before the synagogue, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. So be it. comes from the Greek word parakletos. Okay? I think I got that pretty close. That's where the word paraclete comes from. And Merle, you have nothing to worry about, because Merle said after service last week, he said, you know, I forgot the last verse. I said, well, don't fret any. I forgot to preach about it. <laughs> so see? <laughs> so we're picking up there again, because I got so much on the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and that we don't want to do that that I forgot that right afterwards it tells us why we have the Holy Spirit with us, one major reason. And that's so that when we do proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ, we won't have to worry about being persecuted. We won't even have to worry about what we say because at that time when we need it, the Spirit will kick in and give us everything we need to say. And Merle and I talk about that a lot. We'll talk about how in the world can Christians in other parts of the country be persecuted like they are and have the stamina, the courage that they have, the words that they have. Right there's how exactly, because the Holy Spirit will give it to them when they need it. What a perfect, perfect gift from the Father. Jesus has already said in Luke 11 to pray, to ask, to keep asking, to knock, to keep knocking, to seek, to keep seeking. And that our Father in Heaven, because He is a much better Father than what we could ever imagine, will answer our prayers, and He will answer our prayers by giving us the Holy Spirit. Not necessarily the answer that we're looking to for our prayers, but the Holy Spirit and what the purpose of the Spirit is to comfort us, to guide us, to protect us, to give us joy, peace, all of these things. So we're going to look at what this word paraclete means today. And yes, when you think of paraclete, First thing that Jacob thought of was a parakeet. Does that make you feel better, son? That's what I was doing downstairs. So now you have a visual aid to remind you. What was that word? It's like parakeet because I saw him up there with this parakeet on his shoulder. Okay? So, there you go. Put it here. Well, then it'll cover up my beautiful face. Polly, want a cracker? You stepped into that one. <laughs> so, 
So let's go to the beginning and let's find out more about the Holy Spirit. And we'll be learning a little bit about the Trinity today as we go along too. Genesis chapter 1, right? Starting in verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. I actually went to verse 3, see? So I mess up too. I don't know why I have 3 down here. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You find the Trinity all throughout the Bible. You find the Trinity everywhere you look. You just have to look for it and see that. Because the Trinity is the power of God at work. It is the Father's will and plan that even the Son doesn't know that what's going on, that even the Spirit doesn't know what's going on, but God directs His Spirit to carry out that work, and it's carried out through the person and power of Jesus Christ. Trinity. It all comes together. The Holy Spirit was moving and hovering over the waters. The words used there is like an eagle hovers over its nest. It was creating. It was protecting. It was creating an environment that was good for the end result of what God was creating, and that was mankind. Because mankind would be this object that even the heavens are watching to see where our, how our story unfolds, because our story reflects God's story. We were a part of that. And He was creating out of the absence of order, out of the absence of light, out of the absence of light or life, the Spirit was creating these things as God spoke and willed them into existence. John says that Jesus was there in the beginning, that the Word was there and the Word was made flesh and lived among us. More of the Trinity. Skip down to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and in the beginning of that verse it said, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image. The Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. All working together all with God's, the Father's, plan and purpose, and you and I are to be a part of that. It was God's desire that He created mankind. He didn't need us. He chose to create us. It was the reason and climax of creation is God formed man. And in Genesis 2, 7 it says, "...and the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath, the power of God through His Spirit. The Spirit is referred to as breath, is referred to as fire, is referred to as wind. The literal Spirit of God was breathed into mankind and He became a living being, or soul as the King James Version says. <clears throat> Man is the vessel. This is just a vessel, just a body. But our soul is designed to be in an eternal, perfect relationship with God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. We're empowered by the Spirit. That's why we're born again. Jesus said, you must be born again by the Spirit. Because the Trinity of God all coming together. We know what Jesus taught, which was the will of the Father, through the power of the Spirit in our life, as long as we will lay down our lives and be submissive to Him. In Genesis 6, 3, and I'm reading the English Standard Version, Says, then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, he is corrupt, he is physical. His physical vessel will only last or shall, shall be 120 years. You know, we think, well, that, well, it might have been neat to live these long lives and everything, but God made our numbers to not exceed 120 years. But you know what? He did that again for our benefit. Because, see, we live in sin. We don't want to live forever. We don't want to see our loved ones go on. We want to have as much time as we can have on this earth. But when this earth, when this life is over and this vessel dies and is put into a grave or cremated or, as Jacob wants to do, be pitched out to sea with the Viking, you know, lighting you on fire, we'll see if that happens or not. This vessel is gone, but our soul remains. And what we have to decide is if we're going to come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son or not. If we're going to live a life that is submissive to the Spirit because it is the will of God or we're not. So let's fast forward to the New Testament. In John chapter 1, we see Jesus' relationship in this story. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We read about John the Baptist. 
We read about the calling of the disciples, where they were supposed to come and follow after Jesus in His footsteps, in His teachings, to be like the Master. To give up this world, because this world means nothing. The only thing that means something in this world is our obedience to God the Father through the power of the Spirit, learning about Jesus Christ our Lord. Trinity all over again. Then we get an invitation to come and see so that we may believe. That's the purpose of John's Gospel. So that we can understand the calling that the disciples had. And that same calling is our calling. Then in chapter 2 we have the first of the miracles which John calls signs so that we may believe again. And it's no coincidence that that is Jesus at a marriage festival, ceremony, feast, celebration. Because the Lamb of God has come to save His people. That we can be united with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, through the rebirth of the Spirit by faith. Just like the Old Testament saints. All we have to do is believe. But if we truly believe, then our works will show that. We will be obedient to God. If we believe, then we go into chapter, well, into chapter 2. As Jesus clears the temple to, to show us that that old ways of thinking, that works of righteousness are not going to save us, that the law is not going to save us, that no matter how good we are, it's not going to save us. But what's going to save us is chapter 3. That you must be born again. And that's all supplied by God the Father in His perfect ways through Jesus Christ's death, through the power of the Spirit that gives me rebirth. Trinity all over again. Told you we'd talk about it. It's so cool when you look at the workings of God and see how that's done in the Trinity. You must be born again by the Spirit of God. Jesus came to earth. He gave up His throne in heaven, became a man, and was empowered to do his life, his ministry on this earth by the power of the Spirit of God. The power of the Spirit of God even raised him from the dead. If you look through the Bible, you'll see verses that said God raised Jesus from the dead. You'll see verses that said Jesus raised himself from the dead. You'll see verses that say the Spirit raised God from the raised Jesus from the dead. Because again, it's the Trinity all over again. That power of the Spirit is the work of God in creation, in Jesus' miracles in Jesus' resurrection, and in the changed life of a Christian who is no longer the old creation creation that he was, a sinful creation, because we sinned and rebelled, but he is born a new creation in Christ, empowered, as the Scripture read this morning, for all of eternity by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will never leave us. That doesn't imply to this life. It implies from the point of rebirth, salvation, Forever and ever and ever and ever. The Spirit of God will never leave us. Maybe you've heard this story before, but it reminded me of this when I was going through this. Have you ever heard the story of the little child with the sailboat? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But he spent time creating this sailboat and everything. He put all of his heart and effort and work into creating this sailboat. And he went out and took it to the lake to sell it for the first time. And he had a little string tied to it. And a wind came along and gust the sailboat out from under him and broke the string. He lost the sailboat. He was heartbroken because he put so much love into the creation of that sailboat. Well, later he was walking, a couple days later, and he was walking in town and found the sailboat, his sailboat, in the window of a store. And he came in and and told the owner of the store, he said, that's my sailboat. And he said, well, it's not anymore because somebody brought it in and I paid him for it. It's my sailboat now. I own the sailboat. The little child was devastated, but he said, you know what i got to do? I've got to buy this sailboat back. So he raked yards, he cleaned gutters, he did whatever he needed to do to get up the money to buy the sailboat. Then he went back and purchased the sailboat back from the store owner. And then he said, when he got the sailboat in his arms again, he said, I loved you, I created you, and you wandered off from me. I thought I had lost you, but now I have bought you back. And that's exactly what God the Father has done with His creation of mankind. He lovingly created us to be in a relationship with Him. We are the ones that sinned and rebelled. But even through all that, His love never failed. The power of the Trinity never failed. God's perfect plan came about through Jesus Christ. And now His Spirit will dwell with each and every believer forever and ever. You may wonder how... how Am I going to be in in heaven and not sin because I fight with this sinful desire now that I have? And John tells us, he says, if you sin, 
Because, see, if we have the power of God inside of us, we don't have to ever sin again. Jesus didn't sin, and I know He was God, but He was a man. There's no blasphemy there. We have that same spirit in us, and we don't have to sin again. And that is the very reason we will not sin in heaven. Because then we will be totally submissive to the power of the Spirit. So why aren't we trying our best now to get that process going? To be like Christ. Because Jesus and John the Baptist said, Repent, for the kingdom of God has come. <clears throat> so let's go forward to John 3 and look at John 3. In verse 5, Jesus answered and said, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. Now Nicodemus had not even said what was on his heart. Jesus knew his heart again. He had come to Jesus at night because he was afraid of what might happen to him in this world. And that's right where we're back to in Luke 12. In Luke 12, the disciples feared what would happen to them if they went out and spoke the words of Jesus because they wanted to persecute Jesus. So if I went out and herald His name, they're going to want to persecute me. And Jesus said, when that happens, not if that happens, but when that happens, don't worry because you have nothing to worry about. And don't fear what you're going to say because the Spirit will give you what to say at that point in time. So Jesus is telling John the Baptist, you must be born of water. And you can take that several different ways, but the way I'm going to say it today is you must have physical birth when a woman breaks her water and you're born. And that may or may not be the way this verse is meant to be, but it's the way I'm saying it today. And the Spirit. Two things. You have to be born, flesh and blood. But our flesh is corrupted because we sin. And if you're not reborn by the Spirit, this corruptful flesh will spend eternity apart from God in hell. A place never designed for you, but a place designed for Satan and his fallen angels. But if you're born again by the Spirit of God, you don't have to worry about this. Because you're reborn back into the family of God, purchased just like that little sailboat. Purchased back for all eternity. <clears throat> Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem... Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power. That word is dunamis or dynamis, which we get our word from dynamite. That explosive power that cannot be contained. Once you light the fuse, it's going to blow up. So are you lighting the fuse? It's already there. The dynamite's inside of you. It was given to you. The power was given to you. But you've got to access it. You've got to light the fuse if you want to see the explosive power of it. And when that happens, you will be my witnesses. Not might be, will be, because that's your purpose. You were brought back with that purpose, to proclaim God's perfect design, His will, His love through Christ Jesus our Lord, empowered to have a changed life because I let the Spirit dwell inside of me. Trinity. We're going back to our verse this morning, John 14, verses 15 through 17. If you love me, keep my commands. Right? If you love me, do that. And as a result of that, that your faith is genuine because you believe and then therefore you follow, I will ask the Father and He will give you another advocate. The word there is the parakletos. Paraclete. It means counselor, intercessor, comforter, helper. The word is the paraclete. The Holy Spirit is our attorney pleading the case to God the Father because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, did on this cross. Trinity. That's really cool, isn't it? So if you, if you are in trouble with the law, you want the best attorney you can ever find, God Himself, the Spirit residing inside of me, and He's going to be your advocate. And if you notice the word another... Because Jesus Christ paid the price and is sitting beside the Father pleading your case as the advocate also. Wow. You're covered, aren't you? You're covered. Don't ever worry about it. You will get comforting, maybe your, your version says that, and peace and everything else as a result that the Holy Spirit is your counselor, your advocate, pleading your case to God the Father. And He will help you, and He will be with you forever. If there's any questions who this is, this is the Spirit of truth. 
and your word is truth. I'm going to find out more about the Spirit by reading this word and being obedient to it. By praying to the Father as Jesus' steps were guided by the prayer of the Father. By being willing to let the Spirit guide you and lead you. And He will bring you comfort and peace like you've never known. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. So we think we want to see that burning bush or how it would have been to walk with Jesus. But Jesus Himself tells us that it is greater for you, it is better for you if I go away because then the Spirit of God will be within, with you 24-7. You only see me when you're around me, Jesus is saying. But the Spirit of God will reside in you and give you that power every single minute of every single day. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be you continuously forever and ever and ever. The working power of God that was at creation, the working power of God that rose Jesus from the dead is inside of you living. So you have to let Him live through you. Romans 8, 11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, that means if, he's, if that Spirit is in you, then you will... No, you will be able to act. You will be able to respond. You will be comforted. You will be given the things to say as you're testifying the name of Jesus Christ. So starting in Romans 8 verse 9, it says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. You used to be corruptible. You were going to die. You were going to spend an eternity apart from God. But because of His love through Christ Jesus our Lord, we are now in the realm of the Spirit. But here's a contingency. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, you can't just proclaim it. You can't have head knowledge. You've got to have changed heart knowledge. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. You can say you believe all day long, but unless you've been born again because your heart was transformed, then you're not a Christian. Now my point here is read God's Word. It's not to convict you of that. If you're not... <laughs> The answer simple. All you've got to do is say, Father, forgive me. Will you come into my life? I accept what Jesus has done. I've had head knowledge all of my life, but I haven't had this changing heart knowledge. I want that. And then be submissive to the Spirit and watch how He changes people. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The biggest testimony out there to the world is you as a Christian who lives a changed life. Because then they say, well, he's not participating. And even scriptures tell you this. Why are you not participating in these things with us? And you're not hypocritical. You're not hiding them in your closet or anything. You don't want to do them. Why? And you have joy and peace. Why? And then they start examining God's Word and the truth will come to them. The Spirit will come to them and convict them. <clears throat> Verse 10, But if Christ is in you, though even though your body is subject to death because of sin... The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Because of His Spirit who lives in you. That's the end, right? No, there's one more verse. Therefore, brothers and sisters, Christians, those who believe, we have an obligation. Not because we can do anything to pay for our sins, not because we can obtain salvation, but because of the merciful, loving gift that the Father gave to us, and we appreciate it. We have an obligation not to live in the flesh, but it's not to the flesh to living according to it. It's to live a glorified, Christian, changed life. To proclaim the gospel message. So that when that time does come of persecution, and we don't know what to say, and we don't have comfort and peace, the Holy Spirit will give it to us. That's why Paul can sit in prison or wherever he's at, he can be in need or he can have plenty and proclaim and mean it that he's at peace with God. He just wants to herald the gospel message to others so that they can know that. So let's go back to Luke 12 and kind of tie it together. <clears throat> Luke 12 begins with Jesus has just addressed the Pharisees and the experts of the law. He has said, woe to them, asking them, can you not see, I'm going to point out the problems that you have, can you not see and repent and come to me? He wasn't judging them. Scripture's clear about that. He was saying, come to me. And then he redirects his conversation in chapter 12 to his closest disciples. 
giving them more instructions. So in verse 1, it reads, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands has gathered, so that they were trampling on, his, on one another, Jesus began to speak first to His disciples. Now, if there were thousands of people gathering around trampling on each other, it would make sense to me, in my mind, to address this crowd first, especially before they get out of control, before they hurt anybody. But see, Jesus knew their hearts again. Look at John 6, 66. He tells them that they only are there for what they can get. That's why the crowd's there. They've already seen Him raise Lazarus from the dead. They want to see more miracles. They want what they can get out of God, not what God can give them, and especially not to become a servant or a slave to the gospel message. So he focuses attention on his disciples because that's what matters. He says, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So he tells them right off, I've just addressed the Pharisees. They're not listening because they're wearing a mask. They don't understand because their hearts are hard, far from me. They may look like they are, but they're not. Be careful because, number one, that's the first thing you need to be careful of. Because many of you say your heart is with me, but your actions and deeds are far from me. So you better examine, are you wearing a mask? Are you genuine? Verse 2, There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. So here's the second thing that he points out. Promise or warning, depends on how you look at it. Everything will come out. Everything will be made clear. So if you've done a good job, you've got nothing to worry about. If you haven't done a good job, maybe you should reevaluate right now. I know you have the advocate who is God Himself for you, but you still want to live a worthy life. You want to bring glory and honor to God who gave up the life of His Son for you. What you've said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what has, you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. That's how they spread the news in that day. Verse 4, I tell you, my friends, those who are closest to me, he's reiterating that I'm talking to you guys who are closest to me. <clears throat> I tell you, friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. Because, see, that was expected to happen next. If you proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ and praise God we're not persecuted in this country, like other Christians in the world are every single day. So take that and say, wow, thank you, Lord. How many more opportunities will you show me and will I be obedient to carry out your gospel message? Because I have the opportunity not to really be persecuted. Sure, I might lose a promotion at work. I might even get fired at work. My friends may not like me. whoop de doo right? <clears throat> Men can kill you. But God holds the eternity of your very soul in His hands. Verse 5, But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear Him who after the body has been killed has the authority to throw you into hell. He is judge. What He says goes. There's not going to be any second chances. There's not going to be pleading your case outside of your advocate. Your advocate knows your situation. And He tells you how to plead. He knows you're a sinner... But he says, hey, hey, you're saved by grace. Plead not guilty. Right? All those sins and crimes that you've committed, he says, plead not guilty. I got you covered. That's so neat. <clears throat> yes, I tell you, fear him. Verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. The fourth thing God, that Jesus says here is you have such value. I am going to die. I'm God's son. And I'm going to die to save you. Can you even fathom the value that you have to the Father? <clears throat> Verse 7. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Don't be afraid. You have no reason to fear whatsoever. Verse 8. I tell you, and he's saying again, listen up. If you haven't heard this, verily, verily, hey, listen. 
I'm telling you, my closest disciples and friends, so you'll get this. Whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. That statement is made to his closest followers. That I will proclaim you if you proclaim me. You have nothing to worry about. But if you disown me, it's going to be proof that your heart is far from me. And I will disown you. I will not be your advocate pleading your case at the right hand of the Father. Because the Spirit does not preside in you and He will not advocate your case either. You're doomed. All of these things He's saying to the disciples. So do we get to verse 10. And He says, Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. If the Holy Spirit is not here residing in you, you're not born again. No matter what you think, no matter what you've said, no matter what mask you wear, if the Holy Spirit doesn't reside in your heart, then you're not saved. That's what Jesus is saying. So when you're brought, not if you're brought, verse 11, He's still addressing the disciples before synagogues, rulers and authorities because you proclaim the gospel message in my name and they want to kill me, so they're going to want to kill you. Do not worry about how you're going to defend yourself because you don't have to. The Spirit pleads your case, I'm pleading your case. You don't have to worry at all. So if you don't have to worry, what's stopping you? What's holding you back? If you have more worth to the Father than, than anything you can imagine, what's stopping you from leading an obedient life? <clears throat> or don't worry about what you say. Now the King James Version says don't give any thought or worry about what you're going to say. I like that better because not even, do you not need to worry about what you say? It said don't even give a thought to it. Don't even think second time about it. That should not even be in your mind what you're going to think or say or who you should fear. Because God is on your side. Jesus is on your side. The Holy Spirit is on your side. Pretty simple plan, isn't it? Go proclaim the gospel message and live a life of worth. Verse 12, 4, so it ties that together. It's a preposition. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at the time what you should say. You have nothing to worry about because the Holy Spirit will take care of it for you. You don't have to go practice up. Yes, you should pray. Yes, you should memorize Scripture. Study to show thyself approved, an approved workman that needeth not to be ashamed, that can rightly divide the word of this truth, that has a knowledge of it. But it isn't because you're relying on your ability or power. It's because you're obedient to the Spirit, and He'll give you anything and everything you need to say. So that even when you forget to say a Bible verse or preach about it, you'll have the opportunity in the next time to do it. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit is our paraclete. It literally means summoned to the side or the aid of someone. Who summoned the Holy Spirit? Jesus by asking the Father. That's what He says. The Father sent. So the Father sent. Trinity all over again. God Himself living inside of each of us, pleading our case, empowering us, comforting us, bringing us joy. <clears throat> Because we are guilty, but because we believe in faith, we are counted as righteous because of what Jesus has done. That God the Father no longer sees us as sinners or sees the stains of our sins. He sees us righteous because of Jesus' righteousness. Wow, we need to be thankful to God. We need to praise His holy name. I want to read this because I wrote this down and I want to read it this way. It says, not guilty. That's what our advocate has told us to plead. Because you get that counseling from the lawyer. It says, how are we going to plead everything? Let's talk about your case. And he says, not guilty. And that makes no sense to us whatsoever from our frame of mind. Because we know how guilty we are. Before God Almighty is how a Christian stands. Not guilty. That alone should change the way you think and live. The Trinity is a tough concept, but here is another thing to think about the Trinity. The Spirit and Jesus are our paracletes. 
Jesus paid the penalty of our crimes and stands before God the Father, claiming your innocence and brotherhood. The Holy Spirit stands as your defense lawyer, claiming your innocence and adoption as God's own child. And the judge is your father, who sent his son Jesus to pay for your crimes, and then sent his spirit to seal the deal and empower you to live as a child of God, that he is adopted as his very own forever and ever. Now what do you think about the Trinity and God's perfect plan and will? All this in this lifetime, and heaven is still to come. Praise God. Psalms tell us to taste and see how good the Lord is. When you taste something that's good, crab legs for me, I just want to eat them over and over again, right? They're so good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Matthew 28, 20 ends with, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Jesus left. <laughs> He's with me inside of me. So is God the Father. So is my advocate, the Spirit, and my advocate and Savior, Jesus. S saying that whole section of verses 18 through 20, Jesus came to them and said, All authority is given to me in heaven from God the Father, and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as a result of this authority given to me by God the Father, go and make disciples of all nations. Not just make believers, but disciples training them up to follow the ways of their Master and Lord, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely you don't have anything to worry about because I am with you as your advocate. The Spirit of God is with you as your advocate, claiming your brotherhood, claiming your sonship. I am with you to the very end of the age. John is the only author who uses this word parakletos. He uses it five times. And I want to tell you what those verses are. Maybe you want to write them down so you can go later and look at them. Because five times in Scripture you can find this verse, or this word, all used by John. The first one was John 14, 16, when it says, I will ask the Father and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. <coughs> the next one is in John 14, verse 26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, and if you'll notice, the first one says, I'll ask the Father. This one says, the Father will send in my name. So we'll see little differences. He will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said. Oh, that's nice. John 15, 26, when the Advocate comes, whom I will send, because I, Jesus, and the Father are the same, Scripture tells us that, to you from the Father, the Spirit of th truth, who goes out from the Father, He will testify about me so that you learn more about our Lord. Because we're not walking with Him like the disciples are. But yes, we are still walking with Him just as disciples are because we have the Spirit inside of us every day. Then John 16, 7, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. All of these words, paraclete, so that you can see what the Spirit does. Now, I like this one best. 1 John 2.1. I alluded to it earlier, but didn't read it. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. That power inside of you so that you don't have to ever sin again. But if anybody does sin then we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. What a powerful promise that God has given us, that Jesus proclaims to us, that God Himself resides inside of us. In John chapter 14, I just want to read the section where our passage was from this morning, so you can get a little better use of how Jesus is using those three uh, verses that we spoke of earlier. Starting verse 1, it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not worry. I can't stress it enough. Because they were worried that Jesus was leaving them and they didn't know what they were going to do. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, <clears throat> and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Because <laughs> you've seen the Father, Trinity. If you've seen me, Jesus. Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you I do not speak on my own authority. Rather it is the Father living in me by the power of the Spirit who is doing His work. Power of the Spirit. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. A changed Christian life. Don't say there's not miracles anymore. Changed Christian life. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do works I have been doing, and they will do even greater than these. Wow. Because I am going to the Father, but I'm sending the power of God back to you, right? And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He lives with you and will be with you. I, Jesus, will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you in the Spirit. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And that's the only way that you can see Christ. The only way that you can inherit the kingdom of God is if the Spirit has given you rebirth. Because I do live in you, and you also will live as a result. Can you see the promise here? Can you see the blessings that you have as a Christian? So that we should go out and proclaim and not worry about the, what the world can do to us. What's going to happen to us? So what if men beat us or imprison us? Because they can't take away our salvation. They can't take away that relationship. They can't even take away the peace and the joy that I have through the Spirit. So tying that all back to Luke 12, verses 10 through 12. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before the synagogues, rulers, and authority, when you're persecuted, maybe even in prison, maybe even killed for your belief, do not worry about how you're going to defend yourselves because it doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is defending you and you know what the outcome is. Not guilty. Come home. <clears throat> Don't worry about how you defend yourself or what you will say for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power, the power of God, the Spirit, has, all, has given us already, we've already got this when we became a son or daughter of the living God, everything that we need for what? A godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and His goodness. We are children of God, heralds, messengers, brothers of Christ, and God is pleading, his case is being pleaded to God through the Son and through the Spirit. And as a Christian, you have nothing to worry about. So let's proclaim the Word of God. You want to with me? We think about that at least. And then we'll figure out how we're going to do it. And the first way we can do it <laughs> is by going to the flagpole and praying on Thursday and inviting somebody to community worship on Friday, right? Let me see nods ahead so I will see you there Friday night. Okay? All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much that you would love us the way that you love us, that your ways are perfect. Help us to see even in times of distress and heartache when we don't know the way. Help us to see through the power of your Spirit, not by our own minds, but through the Spirit of God Himself, that we are loved, that we are redeemed, that we are righteous. And we just thank you of the obedience of Jesus. We thank you for the power of the Spirit. We thank you that your ways are perfect and that you love us so much. May our lives bring glory and honor to you and may we draw others to Christ. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
high.